Just in case I don't know you or if you haven't met me, I'm Brett Terry. I'm one of your pastors here. We're going to continue our summer series on Kingdom Life. And we've unpacked some of that and we're looking at our identity in Christ and, and seeing what that means to us and how we live that out. And so I want to remind us of a key thing that um, is, is very important, I think, for us to understand. God reveals who He is through what He does. He doesn't define Himself through what He does. He merely lives out who He already is. That's very important for us because we almost always do the reverse. We try to define ourselves through what we do, whether it's the relationships that we're in, whether it's the work we do, whether it's the things we're passionate about. We try to create our own identity many times through what we do. God doesn't do that. He merely reveals who He already is. He acts out of who He is. That's important for us to get that. And what has happened with human beings is we often try to create our own identity instead of living out the identity God has for us in Jesus Christ. And when we do that, in effect, what we've done is we've taken, whether it's a person, a relationship, uh, a position, whether it's our career, our work, that thing becomes an idol then. That's the thing that we're looking to for satisfaction, joy, value, meaning in life. And because God's the creator and he didn't create things to work that way, it's always going to fail. And that's going to cause problems for us. So we need to grip that and see that God says, I have an identity for you. Even though human beings have walked away from the identity I created them for and declared for them and live in a broken, sinful world as broken, sinful human beings, he says, I can restore your identity. I can give you a new identity through Jesus. And I want you to live out of that, not to gain my favor, my acceptance, my approval, but I want you to accept the identity I've declared for you in Jesus and then live that out. And so we're going to continue on looking at that this morning. What does that mean for us? How do we live that out? I want to start, I'm going to look at a couple different places, and a little later on I'll ask you to turn with me. You can turn to wherever I'm reading anytime, but some of this will be up on the screen for you to follow along if you can't get to it quick enough. Jesus speaking, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Right before he left earth physically, he had a group of about 120 of his followers around, and this is what he said to them. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm the king. I'm the, I'm the one, the creator. I have all authority. So I, what I'm going to say to you is based on who I am, Jesus saying that. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of or under the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the triune God, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, a few weeks ago, we looked at not only is it under the authority of the triune God, but as we see each person of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, that gives us some clues as to our new identity in Jesus as well. A few weeks back, we looked at the first of these three names here, God, the Father. So what does that make us? Family. He's our Father. We're in His family because of what Jesus has done. Today, we're going to focus on the second one, God, the Son, Jesus. Who is He? So that we can understand who we are in Him. Jesus is the servant king. See, back in the beginning when God created all the creation and then he created human beings last, the man and the woman, and he said, okay, all this is for you. And because I have all authority, I'm going to delegate some of that to you. I'm going to allow you to continue to work with me in my creation to develop it, to care for it, to expand it. I'm giving you that authority. You're going to work with me yet under me. It's still mine, but I'm allowing you to work with me in this. He says, that's the identity I declare for you. This was before they'd done anything. Of course, they turned away from that. They didn't accept God's identity. They didn't believe him. They believed a lie. They said, no, we're going to create our own identity through what we do. And they ate fruit that God told them not to eat, and it didn't add anything positive to them, and it ended up introducing messed up brokenness in the world and in the human race. And we still see that today. So when Jesus came, he came to regain what was corrupted of that original design and intent that God had. See, basically when the first people just walked away from their God-declared identity, they handed over the authority that God had delegated to them to Satan. Said, okay, now we're going to live in the mess. 
and they became enslaved to Him instead of living out the identity God had for them as rulers under and with Him. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 28. I'm going to be reading this from the English Standard Version. If you have an app and you want to queue it up in the same thing. It says this, As in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he, he that is Jesus, the Christ, delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign, that's what kings do, until he's put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For, and then he quotes from the Old Testament prophets, God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to Him, then the Son Himself will also be subjected to Him who put all things in subjection under Him, that God may be all in all. I know some of you are going, what did you just say? <laughs> um, this, this is what He says here. He goes, Jesus came as part of the Godhead. There was a mutual agreement here. It wasn't that Jesus drew the short straw and, and then they said, oh, okay, you're the one that has to do it. There was a mutual agreement between the Father, Son, and the Spirit that Jesus was come as the King and He would do what kings do. He would reign until God the Father's kingdom was fully realized here on earth. And then He would hand the kingdom back over to the Father because that's who's in charge, just like people were created to originally do, to work under yet with God. And so He was going to come and regain what we gave up. When earthly kings come, they need a lot of stuff. And I know we don't, as Americans... We don't like kings because that's not our culture, and we don't readily grasp the idea of kingship. But we can even see it with political leaders, right? Especially the higher up they are in the, the chain of command. Political leaders or kings need a lot of stuff in order to carry out what they're going to do, right? They need authority because they want to be over land, resources, people, be in charge. And they may have various motives for that. But in order to get in charge, they're going to have to fight battles to get there, whether it's military, fighting an actual war, or if it's just political. Do you remember the last political cycle? Did you read the papers, listen to anything? Was it, did it seem warlike, you know, going back and forth? you you got to fight to get control, and so you don't just come in and serve it. You fight, get control, and you got to have an army, or even if it's an army of volunteers for your political campaign. And if you have an army, you have to resource them. You've got to pay your military. You've got to provide stuff for your workers, your volunteers. But in order to provide all that stuff to pay them or get the resources, you've got to have money. And so if you're going to get money, you've got to hire wise advisors who can help you talk rich people into giving you their money, right? So you can do all this stuff. So political figures, kings, they have to be served a lot. They need a lot of stuff in order to carry out their ruling, their kingship, or their oversight. Jesus came very different than that, didn't he? He came born as a baby in a very poor family, without fanfare, without demanding a bunch of attention, without asking a bunch of people to serve him. He did just the reverse of what we see going on all around us. He came as a servant king, very unlike kings and political leaders that we're aware of. That was the original design and intent that God had for people. We messed it up. We walked away from it. Jesus came back to regain that. And Jesus came humbly, ready to serve, not to be served. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says this very thing, reinforces it. I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. You, and when he says that, he's talking to followers of Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus here this morning... This is we, us. We must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God. And how did he do that? And died a criminal's death on a cross. 
Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This attitude is a direct contradiction of our whole culture, isn't it? Um, if, if Jesus had shown up in our time, I'm sure people would have gathered around him and said, oh, no, no, you need to take care of you first. That's what's important. You need to look out for you. He goes, no, I'm God. I know who I am, but that's, I'm not grasping that. I'm willing to serve others. And don't reinterpret this as an American because we tend to do this, you and I. We go, oh, well, he humbled himself so that he could be the big deal at the end. That's not the point of this passage. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'm going to try to be really humble for a while, and then I'll be a big deal. No, that's not it. He knows who he is. He lives that out while he's here on earth. Jesus is the king. Okay, remember, God reveals who he is through what he does. So as we look at Jesus, we see, so he's the king, so how does he live that out? Okay, now I'd like you to turn with me. John chapter 2. It's one of the gospels in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I'll be reading this from the English Standard Version. So if you're in an app, you can be in the, you're welcome to follow along in whatever version you'd like to. If you don't have an app or you don't have your own print Bible, you should be able to find a little black hardback Bible under the chair in front of you or close to you. And in those Bibles will be on page 887. And by the way, if you don't have your own print Bible, take that one. Or if it's a little beat up, find a better one. Take it home with you. We'd like for you to have a copy of God's Word. John 2, 11. This is right at the beginning. Jesus is about 30 years old. He, he started into his public ministry a little bit. He's functioning as a rabbi. He's teaching God's word. He's gathered some apprentices, some disciples to him. But he hasn't really full-blown revealed that he is the Messiah, the Savior, the promised one that's going to set everything right. He's just functioning as a teacher, and he's talked some about who he is, but it's not full-blown yet. And this is right at the beginning of his public ministry. And so this is what we read. It says, On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. So Jesus is there. If you invite a rabbi in this culture to your function, wedding, whatever it is, you expect his apprentices will be with him. So this is pretty normal here. Uh, Probably must be somebody they knew because Jesus' mom is there too, so maybe they were friends of the family we don't know. The thing I want us to get is this. This is not their family's wedding. It's not their party. And remember, again, too, we talked about this a little bit. In Jewish culture at this time, normally a wedding was a week-long blowout, not just a couple hours like we do. So it's a big deal. It's a big shindig that goes on. So Jesus is there. Verse 3 when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. The party's not over. They're running out of wine. This is an embarrassment. This is shameful for the bride and groom and their family. It's like um, if you were to go to a wedding this summer and they have a dinner afterwards and everybody's invited and you get your about five people back from the food table and then one of the caterers comes out and says, hey, sorry, we ran out of food. What's your first thought? Oh, well, is that it? No. You're like, are you kidding me? Why didn't they plan? See, <laughs> we do the same thing today. And so this is an embarrassment. And Mary notices it. She's very mom-like here, I, th I think. You know, she's looking at all the details like, oh, oh, they're out of wine. She goes to Jesus. She has some idea th of who he is. And he goes, she says, Jesus, they're, they're out of wine. Jesus uh, replies in verse 4, he says to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. What he's saying here is this. He's saying, mom, this is not on the agenda. It's not time for me to full-blown reveal who I am yet. This is not the father's plan. He's not talking sassy to her or being disrespectful. He's just saying, this isn't the time for me to show who I am to all these people here. His mother, again, I think very mom-like, said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. It's like, oh, she could have been my mom, you know. I talk to her, she doesn't listen. <laughs> Just goes on with what she's got planned. But she does. So, now there were six stone water jars there 
for the Jewish rites of purification. Do you get the idea what these are for? These are hand-washing jars. They're, they're stone jars. They're using them for their purification rites. They do this ceremonially. It's for cleaning up. Six stone water jars were there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. So they're pretty good-sized deals. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. They filled them up to the brim. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping they rinsed them out first. <laughs> but they fill them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast, this isn't the bride or the groom, this is somebody, the master of ceremonies here. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you've kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Canaan and Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Think, think this through. Let's be conservative. It says each one of these pots holds 20 to 30 gallons. So just let's go with a low number, 20 gallons. So if there's six of them, how much is this? 120 gallons of wine that Jesus makes from water. And there's no, there's no special stopping or pronouncement or music swelling. He just says, fill them up. He says, now take it to the MC. And it's changed. And he tastes it because they're, I don't know if the bride and groom are aware that they've run out of wine or the master's ceremonies. He might have been thinking, oh boy, this is going to be bad. And then they go, oh no, they found some more wine. Great. And he tastes it because that's the perks of being the MC. You get to taste it first. He tastes it and he goes, wow, this is good stuff. It's not like, you know, that uh, three buck chuck at Trader Joe's. This is good. This is good wine. And he says, that's not normally you have all the best stuff and the best presentation at the beginning because people are expecting and they're hungry and they're thirsty. He says, but you've saved the good stuff till now. Wow, you're awesome. He calls over to the bridegroom. You're awesome. You did this. And I'm guessing the bridegroom is over there like, oh, okay. Because he doesn't know where, what happened. Who knows about this? The servants and Jesus' apprentice. He doesn't take credit. He doesn't get credit. The vast majority, he doesn't really reveal who he is. He, a few people find out through this, but he doesn't really reveal that he is, in fact, the Savior, the Messiah to this whole great crowd. A few people get in on it, and they see what's going on, but most people doesn't. Was this Jesus' responsibility here? No, this isn't his party. He's not the host. It's not his family. He's there as a guest. And what does King Jesus do? He brings better wine. He enhances their celebration, even though it's not his responsibility, not his problem, and he doesn't really get any credit for it. And he's there at a celebration. This is at the very beginning of his public ministry. This gives us a little glimpse as we look at, if we're servants of the King of Kings, and we are, if we're part of Jesus' family, citizens in God's kingdom, this gives us a glimpse of how we can live out our identity as servants to the servant King Jesus. We can bring better wine to celebrations around us. How can we enhance the celebrations that are going on around us? Now, I want you to turn over a few pages to John chapter 13. John 13, again, in those Bibles from under your seats, we're on page 900, if you're in there. John 13, and I want to read uh, the first several verses of this. This is... It's kind of interesting because this is right at the end of Jesus' three years of public ministry. So I notice this here. Both of these are celebrations. The wedding celebration is at the very beginning. Then it says here, now before the feast of the Passover, here's another celebration, very different in significance than the wedding, but nevertheless a celebration. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, he knows that he's heading for the cross. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, listen to this, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he'd come from God and was going back to God, 
rose from supper. Why is this in here? Jesus is operating out of who He is. He knows who He is. He knows what He's done. He knows what He's about to do. He knows where He came from. He knows where He's going. He knows what the Father has given Him. He knows His identity. What He's about to do isn't to prove a point to somebody or try to get them to understand who He is. He's living out who He already is. He completely understands who He is. What He's about to do is going to come out of that. So, He rose from supper, verse 4. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. We need to understand the culture here a little bit. This was a common courtesy because of the time and the place. People were walking around. Even if they were clean and fresh when they showed up somewhere, it was a common courtesy to give them some water and towels to wash their feet. If you were wealthy and you had servants, you would have your servants do it. And by the way, this wasn't like a coveted job among the servants. You know? It wasn't like, oh, the master's going to have somebody in today. Who gets to wash feet? That wasn't the attitude. It was more like this, like, you're the lowest guy on the totem pole. You're doing it. Be kind of like this. If I said, okay, we're going to, uh, how many people would like to volunteer after this service to wash people's feet as they go out? I'd get, yeah, this response, yeah. Very few. First service, one guy did raise his hand just to be ornery, you know. But. This is menial servant works, nothing anybody wants to do, aspires to. They've rented a room to celebrate the Feast of the Passover in, and nobody's lined this up. And so Jesus, King Jesus, notices this. He gets up, and he starts doing it. Then in... Um, Verse 8, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Well, excuse me, let me back up. Verse 6, he, Jesus came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Peter recognized, he goes, wait, this is wrong. You're, you're the top guy here. You're the master. You're the rabbi. You're our mentor. You're the Messiah. You shouldn't be doing this kind of work. He goes, this is, this is weird. I'm not going to let you do this. This shouldn't happen. He recognizes this is off. Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered, what I'm, going to, what I'm doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. Peter says, yeah, I'm going to do this, Peter. You, you'll get it in a minute here. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to, excuse me, I keep skipping ahead here. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, when he said, okay, if I don't wash you, you're not going to be, you're not on the team with me. He says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Peter, you know, he's kind of overboard. And Jesus goes, oh, he says, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. Basically, Jesus does this. He's like, oh, Pete, come on. Man. The cultural thing is you don't give people a bath when they come in. You wash the feet. We're just quit trying to go overboard. We're just doing the cultural thing. For us, what would it be? If somebody had, had a long trip, we don't wash feet. But they get to your house, what do we do? I mean, I thought about that a little bit. We might say, hey, come on in, sit down. Do you want something to drink? The bathroom's over here. You know, we try to make them comfortable, put them at ease. That's kind of what this was in their culture. And Peter's like, oh, okay, so if I, if I don't let you do this, I'm not on the team with you? Okay, so give me a bath. And Jesus' is like, ah, oh, brother, you know. Come on, that's not what we do. We're not giving you a bath. I'm just doing the cultural thing. Verse 12. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, he goes, okay, here's a teachable moment, guys, for you. He says, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. He goes, you think I shouldn't have done this because I'm the top guy here. And he goes, well, you're actually correct. I am the top guy. I am the Savior. I am the King. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. It's not, I don't want you to just know it. I want you to actually live it out. He says, yeah, I'm the top guy here. I'm the king, but I'm the servant king. That's who you are in me. You're servants. You're my servants. You're my friends, and you're working with me and under me and doing the work of my Father. And so what does King Jesus do here when everybody else neglected the menial task that needed to be done? He serves. How does he serve? At the wedding, he served by bringing better wine. Here, he brings the towel. He does those menial cleanup tasks that nobody else wants to do. This gives us another glimpse of how we can serve those around us, whether it's by enhancing their celebration or by doing the menial cleanup stuff that nobody really wants to do and cares about and you rarely get thanked for, either one of those things. And isn't it interesting that Jesus' public ministry is bookended with celebrations? He starts out at a wedding in Galilee. He ends with, the Feast of the Passover, another celebration. Could it be that G Jesus wants us to celebrate more than we do? To think about all the reasons He's given us to celebrate? Too many times I, I've been in churches over the years where the theme song seems to be from the guards of the Wizard of Oz, you know, oh, ee, oh. People are like, oh, you can't have... This is church. We can't have any fun. You kids, stop having fun. This is church. What do you do? There's tons of stuff about celebration. Yes, there's difficult times too, but it's interesting to me that Jesus' ministry is bookended with celebrations. So we can serve those around us by bringing the better wine. This is a very easy for, for me to remember, to get a grip on, or the towel. We'll unpack that over the next few weeks, how we can practically do that. Jesus, our King, brings us into God's family so that we can serve the Father just as He does. Jesus directs us to serve with Him and under Him. It's not our agenda, it's His. What if you and I, this week, start to see Jesus as our true and better boss? Because we all have a boss in some way or another. If you're working at some place and you got a boss, or you're the boss but you have customers that you have to satisfy or people higher up on the administrative chain. Even if you're working in your home uh, like a stay-at-home mom, you still, you're working in some ways for your family, for your husband. You have other people with expectations. What if we started to see Jesus as our true, our real, and better boss? Because that's exactly what he is. King Jesus. He says, you're really serving me. Keep that in mind. That's exactly what he wants from you and I every day, that we're his servants. We're his brothers and sisters. We're in God's family. We're also servants to the servant king, God the Son. I want to read one more passage. I'm going to read it from two different versions. Um, the first one is English Standard Version, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, and brothers here is the generic. It means brothers and sisters, so ladies, you're in this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, I also want to read it out of the message just because I think it's great color commentary and brings to life what we just read here. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. 
Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So what does this mean for you and I? Who is God, specifically God the Son? He's our King. He's a servant King. What has He done? He served us. He did that, we see very vividly, by going to the cross, suffering the consequences of our brokenness and sin, making it possible for us to be back in God's family, members of His kingdom. So, if you and I are in Christ, because we've accepted our God-declared identity in Jesus, who are we? Then we're servants with King Jesus. We're working with Him and under Him, His agenda, not ours. If we believe this, how will we live that out? We will serve each other, God's family, and also others around us, even when at times we get no thanks, we get no credit, or sometimes people don't even really know about it. That's part of that work in God's kingdom. So I want to challenge you to do this this week. Discuss with a couple of your brothers and sisters Get out of your own head. The longer those conversations go on just with you in your own head, the weirder they get. That's what I've found. So talk with some other people and, and ask with brothers and sisters, go, how can we celebrate God in the next few weeks? I realize we just passed last week at this huge blowout celebration in our country and culture, right? It was so cool. Um, Monday, the 3rd of July, there's several families uh, from Bethel, that all live in the same block on a street. And I don't know if they initiated it or if they joined in, but it's been going on for a couple of years. They close off their block and have a block party. And it's not just the people from Bethel, but other neighbors there too. They had a water thing for the kids. They had food. I know some of the families from Bethel provided most of the like meat that was being grilled. People were sitting around visiting. It was just a great time to serve neighbors and get them together and celebrate the freedom that God's given us. And I saw them both bringing the better wine and the towel because there was a ton of cleanup afterwards too. I'm guessing a lot of, like Martha and I, we walked over there. We enjoyed it. We sat, we ate food. We got to visit with people. Then after a couple hours, we discovered we were sitting too close to the kids with squirt guns, so we left. Um, and, but I know there was a ton of work that went on afterwards too. So they, they were doing that. Can we do that? Yes. Yeah. So talk with your brothers and sisters. How can we celebrate God in the next few weeks? Is there anyone we can include in the celebration besides just us? Or is there another celebration going on, some event, something that's going on in our community that we can go to and we can bring the better wine, we can enhance that celebration, or that we can bring the towel and help clean up, do some of that stuff that nobody else wants to do that gets dumped on the, the few people that are left? How can we bring the better wine or a towel to that celebration? And always a good idea when we're talking together to include God in our conversation and to thank Him. Just to take some time, thanks God for all the reasons you've given us to celebrate in you and maybe name some of those off and, and thank God for your brothers and sisters, fellow citizens in His kingdom. Say, give us some direction. Who, who, where can we start a celebration and invite others in? Or where can we go jump in on somebody else's celebration and, and be servants? After our service ends today, some of our elders will be up here. If you need to know more about how you can be in God's family, be a citizen in His kingdom, they'd be glad to talk with you about that. They're also up here to, if you want to pray about whatever is going on in your life, they're glad to do that. So look for them up here afterwards. But does this sound like a plan for us to live this out? We'll be unpacking it over the next few weeks. What are some more practical ideas on how to live out being servants of King Jesus? But is there enough for you to think on this week? Okay, let's do that then. Let's pray. Father, thanks for your love to us. Um, the tremendous provision that you've made for us in Christ. Not only to have our sin forgiven, but to be right with you to be your children, to be citizens in your kingdom, to have the, the privilege, the opportunity to not just have that position but to actually live that out, to work with you in the work that you're doing here in your kingdom now and we see that that's going to have eternal value and purpose because it'll go on for eternity and we'll enjoy it even more when your kingdom is fully realized here on earth. 
Help us to not just know these things, to just store it away in our head, but to do them, to act on them, to seek your direction, to be focused on your agenda for us, not on our own or how we can kind of put yours on the side of ours, but to really live out the identity that you've given us in Christ. And we thank you that we can come to you because of him, and so we do. Amen.